and welcome to Hadrian. Our mission is to automate American manufacturing, starting with high precision machining. The kind of founding of the company is based on this thesis that industrial power is the base of any great civilization. So Hadrian is a grand attempt to return to that. Putting software into industrial businesses is really hard because you end up building the wrong products. And you end up solving half of the problem or you don't actually solve the real problem. This is one of the core reasons why automation has never really made its way into America. If you want to reshore American manufacturing at a cost basis where we're still able to pay Americans a good wage, you have to give American workers superpowers so they can compete globally. And to do that, it's not good enough to spin up a bunch of software companies to give people tools to help automate automate their thing, you really need to build full stack factories. So Hadrian is blending the best of American manufacturing and the best of American software engineering, which is the two things we do best. This is the vision that we're trying to set for how you should automate manufacturing in America so that America continues to be an industrial superpower, not just that financial or cultural superpower, which for the longevity of the empire is like extremely important. And for our customers, the cost of a part is not $500. It's if that's three days late, you miss a launch, which is $2 million. Or one part is missing from an engine and you can't assemble it and the plane is laid and the plane line down is millions of dollars. If you're missing one part of that of that engine that goes on the plane, you're screwed. And a lot of that problem is this huge degradation in the quality and the speed and the efficiency of the supply chain that's domestic that feeds all of our customers that are making rockets, satellites, fighter jets, drones, everything that's like literally mission critical for the nation. If you build this correctly, the impacts to customers are so huge. The analogy I'll give to software people is like, Imagine if you didn't have AWS and you were trying to start a software company, but AWS didn't exist. So half of your people and time and thought was just like managing service. We've now solved that. People can concentrate on the other stuff. And what we believe is that our customers should be focused on designing and iterating on products as fast as possible to deploy them to the warfighter, deploy them to space, deploy them to medical devices, like make human life better, get us to the stars, defend us against external threats. And they shouldn't have to worry about the simple job of, oh, I have this production schedule. Am I even going to get my stuff on time? Do do I have to hold a year's worth of inventory of parts just to be able to like feel secure in the fact that I can promise my customers that I'm gonna deliver them a plane on time. That's what we're trying to do for American domestic manufacturing where you abstract this layer of autonomous production and they can focus on the things that they're brilliant at, which is designing and building incredible products super fast, scaling them up. And yes, the only way to do it is build full stack factories because it's impossible to solve this problem by just plugging, plugging software on top of stuff that doesn't even work in the first place. So we have basically two sides of the business. We make parts and we inspect parts and we do them with as much software and robotics as humanly possible. We are in on the weekend. All the lights that are green or blue are uh, actively running parts and there is barely anyone here. Machining, welding, castings, forgings, everything in America. There's a huge shortage of skills trades. So our strategy is automate as much as possible with software and robotics. And where you can't, we train people in 20 to 30 days using our automated system so they can perform like a master machinist. Any part can run on any machine, which takes a lot of software to do. And by doing that, you can load balance the factory, which makes us stupidly efficient, which means you lower cost to customers. We can run lights out. We can run at like a one to five, one to six human to machine ratio. And our equipment uptime is close to automotive levels, whereas usual aerospace manufacturing is 30% equipment uptime. And really what customers want is two things. It's either, hey, I need something in a week or two as a prototype or something's gone wrong and I just need 40 or something tomorrow. And that's your like Uber surcharge speed option. And then there's, I need 50 or hundred or something a week or a month. You know, how many parts go on a rocket? How many rockets are you launching a year? The most important part, apart from cutting a good part is proving to the customer that you cut a good part. That is effectively a contract between the engineer to the customer that says, I want it exactly like this down to, a, you know, several microns. And one micron is about a 70th of a human hair. So they're operating on this extremely precise tolerances. Now, quality is often a huge bottleneck in the industry because what ends up happening is I promised you that I would get you something for your rocket launch by December the 31st. A couple of things went wrong. It's manufacturing. It's a real world. And quality is always a bottleneck and it's always a last step. So it often gets rushed and overlooked and people make mistakes. And that's how you end up with plane doors falling off airplanes or people putting parts that they thought was a good part on a rocket and then a rocket explodes. Like quality is so important to this industry because the end products that we put things on are aircraft, fighter jets, human spaceflight vehicles, rockets. Automating quality means that the human side of like rushing at the end of the week is never really there. All the data is in the right format and we can prove to our customers that we have the highest quality in the industry. You can load a part up, the robot will grab it and then autonomously inspect parts 24 hours a day. 
and capture all the right data so that we can communicate that to our customers. This is a great example of why you need to run a full stack factory to solve the correct problem. So a lot of software companies try and automate CAM programming, which is basically the process of taking a CAD file from a customer and generating G code, which tells the machines how to cut the metal. To do that though, you need context on what cutting tools you've got. You need to know how the machine performs. As a standalone software company, you never have enough data or context about what's going on in the physical world to be able to actually close the loop on all the data and solve the right problems. So you take any pretty standard cutting tool. You might need 20 to 200 unique assemblies of a tool holder and a cutting tool for a single customer part, right? On top of that, let's say that for cutting steel parts, this bit lasts 100 minutes, right? Because then it starts to wear down. So actually, depending on the cycle time of the part, how much surface area of the metal this tool is cutting, you might actually need to load in six tools if you're making 10 parts of an hour each and this part that this cuts is like eight minutes, right? And you abstract that across a whole factory, it's like an incredibly hard algorithm math problem to simply solve the problem of, does the machine have enough cutting tools in it to be able to keep itself running? Deviation between the digital representation of a cutting tool and the actual reality of the physical world means like almost the whole equation. So one of the things you do is preset and scan every single tool, length, how much it sticks out, every parameter you could possibly grab and encode it on an RFID chip so that when we load this into the machine, the machine automatically knows the exact digital representation of this tool. The end user experience for a machine is at Hadrian is it just works, but there's a lot behind the scenes to basically tie back the imperfections of the physical world to a perfect digital representation so you can actually write software on top of it. So I would say a lot of the software we build like holistically is kind of error managing tolerances of the physical world to tie it back into a perfect software state because then you can write software on top of it. Our software and automation strategies always start with the core hardest problems first and then work out how to make it faster and cheaper over time. You can think about this as like the ability to put Tesla Autopilot on a CNC machine where the user is doing a little bit of steering but you don't need to know what a clutch is. And that's really how we think about a lot of our software is giving human beings superpowers. So this is what version one looks like where it's all our software, it's all autonomous, but it's like big machines with an off-the-shelf pallet system. We basically realized that we could get much higher throughput rates, much lower costs of production if we ended up building our own autonomous machining cell. We ended up designing a system where you can load hundreds and hundreds of parts into this large shelving system. The robots will come grab it out of the other side. These two robots will just feed 14 machines simultaneously. It's going to be five or six X better than the current performance with version one of our whole autonomous like robotic stack. This is really exciting and uh, we'll be up and running the first week of February. It's been an amazing effort by the team to uh, get this launched so quickly. In a couple of quarters, all the desks you see will have gone away. This entire facility will just be filled with machines and inspection machines that are fully roboticized and just ripping out parts 24 seven for customers. At that point, the next milestone is, can we copy and paste this across the country? And the software and the systems and the training and the operations have to be so good that, that when we copy paste it, it continues to run autonomously and we can scale up like AWS scales up data centers or Amazon Logistics scales logistics facilities. That's really the next milestone is going multi-state, multi-region. And that's the scale we have to think about and operate in if we're gonna be successful at the scale we need to for the country. Uh, this is one of my favorite posters and I'm a firm believer that democracy needs a sword. And the reason why we won World War II is it wasn't because we had the fanciest fighter jet. It was because we just had this insane industrial base where we could just crank out everything that we needed to support the war effort. And it's the same thing for getting to space. It's the same thing for building robots on shore. It's the same thing for medical devices. Everything that you can imagine the flying car Jetson's future or that's important to national security starts with, starts with production. It used to be in America, this such a prideful, important profession and trade that supports the whole base of society. And we just lost that from the 80s and 90s onto now. It's really important symbolism and it means a lot to me and it means a lot to the team because we know what the mission is and we know what we're supporting. It's not trivial, it's not a joke, it's quite serious. Without domestic production capacity, everything else kind of doesn't work and that's why it's important to, you know, the mission and the future of the country.
what a week this has been for Deep Tech. Hadrian announces a Series B and uses John Coogan and S3 to announce it. America lands a lander on the moon for the first time since 1967. Varda, a company we featured in S3 a while ago, successfully re-entered their space drugs capsule that they're using to make drugs to save people's lives in space. We have this awesome article published by Aaron about what it means to be a techno-industrialist. And S3 hits 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Obviously, that one's not as cool as the first four, but it's still pretty cool in my mind. Hadrian is a company I've wanted to feature on S3 for a while, and it's so cool and inspiring to see how big they've become so quickly and that Chris didn't have a 20 year working in an industry background. He's new to this and he's learning and moving incredibly fast, which is the whole point in my mind of doing S3 is to tell stories of people who are doing that. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. I can't believe we crossed 10,000 subscribers. That's insane. Um, I'm very excited about the future. I hope you are too. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. And until then, keep on building the future.